Have you ever been to a party and there's that one person who gets out of hand, making everyone around them feel awkward? Maybe it's the conversation, the awkward dance moves, or the unwanted guests. Well, that's what happened to me one night in the spring of 2001. And between you and me, I never thought empathy would play such an important role that night. I was just trying to meet some new people, buy some drugs. I'd been at a bar in Eastern Ontario making small talk with a couple of drug dealers I'd met a few hours earlier. It was closing time and I was relieved. I'd been listening to the same stories and the same jokes for hours. And I'd already made a small drug buy, so I was good to go. Now, this is probably a good time to mention that at the time I was working as the only female undercover drug officer in a large drug unit, and I was a few weeks into an eight month long undercover project. I had a long drive back to my safe house. I had evidence to catalog, notes to make, and just as I was making my goodbyes, one of my new friends invited me to a house party that was just within walking distance of the bar. She didn't know the hosts, but she had heard from the bartender that it was going to be great. So I thought, you know, why not? Who doesn't love more small talk? At the very least, I'd meet some new people, maybe even make another buy. I was still establishing my credibility and it wouldn't hurt to show my face around town a little bit more. So off to the party we go. And when we arrived at the house, it was wall to wall people. It looked and smelled like that party had been going on for days. Now one partier in particular really stood out. He was huge. Now granted, it was a small house and there was lots of people, but he was one of the biggest men I had ever seen. It was like finding the love child of Bigfoot and Chewbacca right there in the kitchen. And he was holding court with dozens of people there. Now, it wasn't just his size that made him so magnetic. He was interesting. He was just telling stories. It, I had heard his name mentioned. And, you know, for the purposes of this talk, let's just call him John. So with a beer in one hand and a cigarette dangling from his lips, his megaphone of a voice was pontificating on everything from art to politics. And his audience hung on his every word. As he spoke, he continued to draw more people into the kitchen. You know, I never saw John take a sip of that beer, but I heard the bottle hit the floor. The partiers were starting to get more and more impaired by the minute. And I recognized it was my time to leave. And just as I started to make my way toward the door, without warning, John grabbed a hold of one of the dealers that I had bought from earlier that night. He had him by the shirt. And from the side, he pulled out a hunting knife and had it to the dealer's throat. In the blink of an eye, John was just holding him there. Now I'll call this dealer Bob. And you could see the terror in Bob's eyes and the anger in John's eyes. Everyone was watching. Hey, I yelled. Now that's a knife, in my best crocodile Dundee voice, getting everyone's attention, including John's. After a few seconds, which felt like hours, John began to laugh. He, he actually let go of Bob and still holding the knife, he started to walk toward me. Now, he almost knocked a few people over. They were either too stoned or drunk to get out of his way, maybe even in shock. Smiling, he came up to me and I'm gonna leave the profanities aside and I'll just paraphrase for you here. But he came up and said, you know, I loved that movie. But you know that guy over there that you came with? He was questioning the kind of quantity of drugs I can get. He has no idea who I am. So I asked John who he was because 
I knew that he wanted to feel respected. And whatever Bob had said or failed to say resulted in John feeling completely disrespected. So I approached John taking his perspective. A few simple questions, some genuine interest on my part, really communicated by my tone, my body language, facial expressions, resulted in diffusing the situation. Now I learned a lot about John that night and I was able to also gather some intel, but more importantly, things ended well. Before John left for the evening with his girlfriend, uh, we had set up a future deal, we got to know each other, and I found out that he was a pretty substantial mid-level dealer that had flown under the radar for quite a while. So what does all this have to do with empathy? Well, quite a lot, actually. I learned very early in my policing career that you cannot build trust with an us versus them mindset. You need empathy to solidify trust. You know, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines empathy as the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. Essentially, empathy describes vicariously taking on people's mental states, facial expressions, postures, literally sharing their experiences. Our brains are wired for this. When we closely observe a person's face, gestures, their posture and tone, our brain begins to align with theirs. This is called neural resonance. It gives us a better understanding of how the person feels. So this even happens when we watch a movie. You know, think about the last time you saw something on the screen and it looked incredibly painful for one of the characters. Maybe when you were watching, you even winced in pain. Researchers have discovered that people with stronger activity in their inferior frontal cortex, a part of the brain that is essential for empathy and imitation, were less likely to cause harm to others. So when we hear a story, our neurons fire in the same pattern as the speaker's brain. And this is known as neural coupling. So our mirror neurons are creating this coherence between the speaker's brain and the listener's brains. And they provide this direct internal experience and maybe the neurological basis of empathy. So when John was captivating his audience in the kitchen, their mirror neurons were triggered. And hopefully, as you listen to my story about John, your mirror neurons were activated, creating the experience of empathy, and you were able to put yourself in my shoes that night. Uh, unless my awful Australian accent took you out of the story, and if that happened, my apologies, because researchers have also found that neural resonance disappears when people communicate poorly. So using an fMRI brain scan experiment, researchers also found that people who paid the most attention, those people we think of as good listeners, the people in the audience leaning forward, could actually anticipate what the speaker was about to say before they said it. Now, have you ever had a conversation like that where you knew what someone was going to say next? Well, that's what happened with John that night. As we stood in the kitchen and talked, well, he, he did most of the talking and I did hopefully most of the listening. What he was going to say next, I could almost anticipate it. And as I felt his level of anger start to rise or things start to change, I would just shift the conversation to his favorite topics, which were fishing and Pokemon cards, believe it or not. So if we want to diffuse the situation, establish trust or repair a relationship, maybe make a new friend, negotiate to win or succeed in any human interaction, we need to ensure that the emotion we consistently communicate is empathy. As an undercover drug officer and later 
as a federal prosecuting attorney, I learned several communication techniques. Although none were technically called emotional intelligence, many focused on social awareness, which is a component of EQ. Social awareness is where empathy resides. So when we actively listen to someone, we're listening with openness and curiosity, demonstrating empathy and displaying a genuine desire to better understand what the other person is experiencing. But what does active listening involve? Well, ideally, it involves communicating trust and respect. But for many of us, we habitually take a different approach, uh, one that has more to do with exercising our own power and influence. It's easy to see this in law enforcement, but it exists in all professions and most human interaction. Think about the last time you met someone new. Were you curious and open, interested in establishing trust and respect? Or were you trying to demonstrate your own power and influence? If you did most of the talking, it was likely the latter. On a flight I recently took from LA to Chicago, just as I was getting seated in the plane, you know, you make that typical small talk. Are you coming in for business or pleasure? Before I even sat down, those were literally the last words I uttered on the flight. The woman went on to talk for the entire four hours. And as we landed, she handed me her card to tell me how much she had enjoyed our conversation, that most people are so difficult to talk to nowadays. I hadn't uttered a single word during that four hour flight. When you actively listen to someone, you're communicating respect. Now admittedly, I probably stopped listening somewhere over Denver, but respect is always a two way street. It is never a one way ticket like this flight was. You get the picture, right? Listening, showing respect and empathizing with the speaker is always a winning communication strategy. And as an added bonus, when people feel listened to, they tend to listen to themselves more carefully and they can clarify their own thoughts and feelings in a way that they become less defensive and oppositional, which is what happened with John. Sometimes they're even more willing to listen to other points of view. You know, empathy is all about perspective taking. We can better achieve this when we adjust our nonverbals in a way that communicates empathy. Unfortunately, our habitual nonverbal reactions often betray us. So we've become so used to being this certain way that we can repeat communication cycles and habits that don't serve us or the people we're trying to communicate with. And this can result in a lack of trust. You know, when I first started working as an undercover police officer, my nonverbals were those of a uniform police officer, which is not helpful when you're trying to work undercover. So the way I walked, my posture, the way I held myself, my expressions, all shouted, I'm a police officer, without me ever saying a word. I'd been in uniform for years and my mannerisms were ingrained. I had to rewrite my non-verbal communication blueprint, although I'd always thought of myself as an empathetic person. Years of being on the scene for some of the worst experiences in people's lives can affect you, slowly leading to cynicism, bordering on apathy. So what some people forget is that no one ever calls the police when everything is going really well. They usually only call them when something has gone terribly wrong. So when I transferred from uniform into the drug unit, I saw this as an opportunity to rewrite my blueprint. I was changing my name, moving to different locations, changing my background story all the time. Of course, I didn't need to change jobs to change my blueprint. I could have done that on any given day and any minute. We all can, but sometimes it's easier when there's a change in the environment. At least that's how it was for me. Working undercover allowed me to reinvent myself. I learned to adjust my nonverbals in a way that communicated empathy and confidence, influencing outcomes even in the most challenging circumstances. You know, in almost a decade, of working undercover, I never had a violent encounter, and I diffused 
more situations than I can accurately recall. And empathetic nonverbal communication is largely responsible for that success. And when I talk to organizations about effective negotiations and trust building strategies, I focus on the nonverbal skills required for that success. And I want to share some of those techniques that I learned during more than 20 years in the criminal justice system that helped me communicate empathy without saying a word. And maybe they'll help you too. So you might have already guessed, of course, that active listening is vitally important to the process. But to courageously connect with others in a way that communicates empathy and builds trust also requires certain nonverbal displays. So maintaining an open posture, this open body language is critical. It lets the other person see that we're physically open, even vulnerable. Because really the most vulnerable part of our anatomy is right from the top of our head, right through our vital organs, down our torso. And when we have it covered up and, and closed off, that communicates something completely different than when we're open and confident, and even exposed and vulnerable. Our open body language signals that we're interested. We want to know more. We're ready to receive. It makes the other person feel seen and acknowledged. Mirroring is another nonverbal technique that communicates empathy. It physically communicates perspective taking, but only when it's subtle and authentic. Have you ever heard that warning, don't try this at home? Well, this is something I actually want you to try at home. Of course, first we're going to do active listening, that's important. And then we're going to subtly mirror body language of the person we're speaking with. Not creepy Simon says, you know, that might have been fun when we were kids. We're going to keep this very subtle. And while we're doing it, we're going to take slower and deeper breaths. Not like you're at yoga class. Remember, we're keeping this subtle, slower and deeper. And within three to five minutes, you're likely going to feel a shift in the mood. You'll feel a connection. And when this happens, you can adjust your posture, maybe change how you're standing. So if you're standing with legs open, maybe you'll cross one. You might move where your arms are positioned. If the other person mirrors your nonverbals within 20 to 30 seconds, empathy is being displayed, rapport is being established, and progress is happening. One of the most observable things about each of us is our emotions. And our emotions are communicated verbally and physically to all of those around us. The words we say, how we say them, and the cues our nonverbals or body language signal are incredibly powerful. As Sherlock Holmes is credited with saying, the world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. What if? we started observing the emotions of the people around us, stepping outside of ourselves for a moment and intentionally communicating with empathy. What if we could not only change our blueprint, but what if we could influence the blueprints of those around us, resulting in a ripple effect of empathy and inspiring trust? Thank you.